I would go to these doctor's appointments over and over and over again for, you know, a year and a half and explain to them what my body felt like. And I just felt like no one was really understanding me. And so then I thought, as opposed to drawing something, if you take something that is a human form already, like a Barbie doll, and then make it look like you feel, Mm -hmm. then that will communicate to people more effectively. So I've done several different ones and they're all about the nerve pain that I feel. Um, And one of them is encased in gray clay. So it looks like concrete. That one's about the numbness and the lack of proprioception. This is Recovery After Stroke with Bill Gassiamis, helping you go from where you are to where you'd rather be. Maggie, g'day and welcome to the podcast. Thank you so much for having me. Thank you. I uh, came across your Instagram and your Facebook, The Great Now What? It was the Thank most, you. it was the most, uh, the most I've been curious about somebody's Instagram or Facebook page because um, the great now what creates a whole bunch of uncertainty about what I'm about to discover when I go into that particular person's profile or page or whatever it is with Instagram. And I thought I have to get in touch with you and find out exactly what the great now what is about. And before we get started and chatting about that, can you tell me a little bit about what happened to you? Sure. Uh, So I was 33 and I was quite healthy and fit. I didn't smoke or have high blood pressure. I didn't, uh, I wasn't overweight. I didn't have any of the warning signs for a stroke. But then uh, on Christmas Day, about four years ago, I had a major stroke, massive stroke in my brainstem, and it was caused by a cavernous angioma, which is a vascular malformation that one in 500 people has. And, uh, (laughs) you know, it was totally out of the blue and really, uh, really changed my life. Um, And I was in the ICU for a while, a nine-hour brain surgery to remove the hemorrhage and I spent a while more in an acute care hospital and then five weeks in a rehab hospital and then I've done months and months and months years now of outpatient therapy yeah where were you when you started to notice something going wrong or did you even notice something was going on yeah so I actually had my first symptom 48 hours before I checked myself into the hospital because I was having a hemorrhagic stroke. um, You know, in retrospect, I've learned you got to get to the hospital. It's so important to get to the hospital. Uh, But because I was having a hemorrhagic stroke, there really wasn't anything that could have been done to change it in any way. Um, But my first symptom was a headache and that was on a Sunday morning, and I thought maybe I'm just dehydrated or I drank too much last night or, you know, stress because at the time I was in a very rigorous MFA program, Master of Fine Arts program in the U.S. in Washington, D.C. at George Washington University, and I just finished my uh, first semester two days prior, and uh, so... You know, when the doctors were like, when was your high stress or high blood pressure event? I was like, well, I just finished a semester's worth of school. Um, But really, this is arbitrary. My stroke was arbitrary. Nothing caused it. Um, Nothing necessarily made it any worse than it might have been. But my first symptom was a headache. And then by 24 hours after that, I had a minor balance problem and or but it was it was major but it was just for an instant and I was like thought I would fall over but I didn't fall over and that was strange but it you know disappeared immediately and then it happened again 
very late that night, you know, I went to bed thinking if I just go to bed, maybe I have the flu. I just need to get enough rest and I'll be okay. And I went to bed that night and got up to use the restroom in the middle of the night. And I had another balance problem. So I thought, oh, geez, by tomorrow morning, I should go see someone. So I checked myself into the hospital. I actually walked to the hospital because I could still walk at that point, And it was only a couple blocks from my apartment, 48 hours after my first symptom. And then 48 hours after my uh, I checked into the hospital, I had to be put on a ventilator um, because my hemorrhage had worsened and I was totally paralyzed on the right side of my face and the left side of my body. And I couldn't speak. I couldn't move. It was a um, real crisis situation. Yeah. It's, uh, it's interesting how you said you should have done something about it. And um, I, left, I left the symptoms. Um, I didn't attend to my symptoms for seven days uh, before I did something about it. And I had a similar uh, arterial venous malformation. Uh, it wasn't in the brainstem. Mine was near the cerebellum. And as it was bleeding, it started to impact more and more of my left side until the entire left side was numb and I couldn't feel. My balance was a little bit off. I was dragging my leg. I know, I know that you said I should have done something about it sooner, but you've got no idea, really, do we? How could we possibly know that you at 33, me at 37, um, you've got something is about to happen that's going to dramatically impact your well-being and potentially kill you. How do you know? You're not a doctor. I had no idea. And, you know, I've gone over this in my head a lot. You know, could I have done something differently? Could I not? And, And several of the doctors have told me, you know, if you had shown up earlier in the ER, we probably would have sent you home, you know, because... Because the issues were not that significant at that moment. So, um, but time is brain when it comes to stroke and 87% of strokes are ischemic strokes, the blood clot climbed and you can, you can do something about those. So I would encourage everyone to get to the hospital ASAP if they're having any of the stroke. Yeah. So, so the message really here is anyone listening who is not certain um, if they know enough about stroke, just also trust your gut instinct. If your gut instinct is telling you there's something wrong, go to the GP, go to the hospital and persist with them to do a scan, do whatever it takes to get a scan and um, see, you know, just look into that that concern and that issue that you have. And also listen to your loved ones because my wife was telling me that she could see me walking differently. She noticed me being different and I ignored her. And unfortunately... You know, I was running around and I was busy and I, and I had work to do and I was highly stressed and I just told her, look, you know, just leave me alone. I've got stuff to do. You know, there's nothing wrong with me. <laughs> I'll just walk it off, right? <laughs> it's, I did say that at one point. Yeah, absolutely. And uh, so bizarre. But wow. <laughs> yeah. And um, so you, you were 33. You were at um, college. You were studying. What were you mm-hmm. what were your uh hoping to achieve with your degree? Was it an arts degree? It was, yeah. So I was getting a master of fine arts in classical acting. I had been a professional actor and voiceover artist for a while and I was going back to this program um which was a lot about Shakespeare and about his contemporaries and how to analyze text and a lot of very physical things like stage combat, movement, dance. And um, I was actually in the best shape of my life because I had just finished a semester's worth of this program that was so physical. And, <laughs> and then I had a stroke all of a sudden. Um, but yeah, I had been an actor before that. And I figured that I wanted to get the terminal degree that you can get in acting, which is an MFA. And then I would be able to teach at the university level if I wanted to, and, you know, continue building my resume as an actor. Yeah. So how was it that you ended up in hospital? Did you have a a massive incident where you collapsed somewhere? Were you with people? How how did that pan out? No. Um, 
I had a headache and then I had a minor or I had this balance thing at about noon the next day. And then um, I was engaged at the time. And my fiance told me that by the end of the second day, the right corner of my mouth had stopped moving. Um, and so my speech was slurred and being a voiceover artist, I was very familiar with how my voice should sound and how I should make my voice be able to sound. And suddenly there was this thing going wrong and I couldn't really figure out why. And then, you know, that middle of the night, I have another balance problem. So in the next morning at about 11 a.m., I had a balance problem and I thought, oh my God, I have to see a doctor. So I had just been approved for new health insurance and I call up the health insurance and they give me a list of doctors I can see and I call up a doctor's office and they say, we can see you in two months. And I say, I need to see someone today, I think. And they said, okay, go to the ER. So I walked to the ER, which is two and a half blocks from my apartment. And I checked myself in um, because I'm, you know, the age I am and I'm quite fit. They don't think I'm having a stroke. It takes six hours for me to get a CAT scan. And then they say, you're having some bleeding in your brainstem. And, um, and they admit me and they put me in the ICU and I get an MRI later that night. And that's when they can really, really tell this is, you know, this vascular malformation. It's in your pons and your top of your brainstem and it's hemorrhaging. And, you know, by the end of that day, I couldn't walk anymore. And then it was about a uh, day and a half after that, that the paralysis was complete and I couldn't move at all and couldn't speak. But you were uh, consciously aware of what was going on to you. Exactly. Yeah. Um, your brainstem is where you have a lot of basic life functions, like your heart rate and your respiration and your body temperature. So if you have a hemorrhage there, it's quite likely you're going to die. But it doesn't impact things like your um, ability to think, um, to process. Um, and, you know, I was able to form the words in my head, but it, I wasn't mm -hmm. able to get them out before the ventilator went in because my tongue and my lips just weren't working. And then um, I lost my gag reflex. So that's why they had to intubate me. And I was totally conscious, but they sedated me because being on a ventilator is very stressful for your body. Your body wants to pull it out. And I, they also put me on a, a steroid to try and lessen the swelling in my brain. But it also gave me these wild hallucinations. Um, so I was totally there. I was cognitively intact. And I was trying to communicate with the outside world through my hand, basically. I would do a thumbs up for yes, a pointer figure for no. Um, that's how they would do the neuro checks on me because um, they were, you know, checking me quite often to see if the hemorrhage was worsening with these yes or no questions. And then, um, you know, my sister thankfully flew in from Colorado to Washington, D.C., when things got really bad, when I got on the ventilator and she would hold my hand and I, she would say the alphabet and I would squeeze her hand on the letter and I would spell out words very, very, very slowly. So I was very, I was aware of everything that was happening to me and it was completely terrifying, but I also couldn't move and I couldn't vocalize at all. And uh, it, was, it was an experience. Yeah. It's uh, a common theme. Um, I never went through the ability not to vocalize or talk, but I um, at one point realized that other people had. So I sought out to speak with people who were locked in. And in a couple of mm. episodes prior, I've had some interviews with some people who were locked in. And 
just to get people to understand what it's like to be locked in or not be able to communicate by voice and how scary that is and therefore how to potentially be better at supporting people in that situation. So I think it's really important for us to talk about it. And although uh, doctors and nurses would come across it a lot, I, I don't know if there's many doctors and nurses who have had the opportunity after to speak to the patient to find out what could we have done better or mm -hmm. what was it like for you? How could we have eased your concerns better or you know, how could we have treated you nicer or I don't know what. So I think it's really important to have these conversations. Um, but I don't want to make this uh, podcast all about the crazy stuff that Stroke does because we know it does a whole bunch of crazy, crazy stuff. I would, I would recommend to everyone, I was not locked in myself, yeah. but I was very close to being locked in. And um, I read a book called The Diving Bell and the Butterfly, written by Jean-Dominique Bobby. He was locked in and he dictated this entire book, letter by letter, blink by blink. And I've read it a couple of times. I think it's magnificent. Wow. And I would recommend it to everyone. What is it called? Can we you repeat that so I can make a note of it? It's called The Diving Bell and The Butterfly. And they also made a film in 2004. It's a French film of the same title, The Diving Bell and the Butterfly. And the wow. film is also gorgeous and so well done. Wow. Thanks for that. We'll definitely put the, that on the links. And then uh, I'm definitely going to go and sort that seek it out and find it and watch it. Um, so um, at 33, you're at the prime of your life. Uh, is your family nearby? I know you said your sister flew in, but or are you living in a, a state where uh, you're quite far away from your loved ones? I was pretty far away. I was living with my fiancé at the time, and we had moved away from our <laughs> network of friends and family to Washington, D.C. so that I could go to graduate school. Thankfully, I had an uncle nearby who happened to be a doctor, not a brain doctor. He's an endocrinologist, but he, um, he came and saw me a couple of times and a cousin nearby. But basically, everyone was in Colorado, which is a solid, like, three-and-a-half-hour flight from Washington, D.C., and my sister lived in the mountains, so she had to drive in a snowstorm a couple of hours down from the mountains to get to Denver, to get to the airport, to fly to Washington to um, help me. And eventually, my mom came about six days later when I had to have brain surgery, um, and my brother-in-law and my fiancé's father. So I, I did have a lot of people around me at this crucial time, which was a blessing yeah beautiful when you had surgery um after uh i suspect you went through the initial rehabilitation stage how long were you in hospital for so after the surgery i was in the icu for another five days in the acute care hospital for another two weeks and then in an inpatient rehab hospital for another five weeks so all total, I spent two months in different hospitals. And then you go home. You go home. Right. <laughs> back to the place you were living with your fiancé. Is that where you ended up? Mm -hmm. Yeah, we had an apartment. And uh, thankfully, it was not too difficult to get around. There was an elevator. And uh, I had the building people install a grab bar in the in the bathroom um but thankfully there weren't like stairs in my home or anything like that that I had to deal with it was um it was hard enough just coming back to that apartment and being so changed yeah and how how was that transition I imagine it was difficult but what some of the things that started to go wrong or you couldn't cope with while while you were back, what was happening? Well, I just, I heard some people say to me that only 10% of stroke survivors made a full recovery. And basically, 
I thought to myself, okay, I'm going to be in that 10%. I'm just going to work really hard. That's how I've achieved everything before in my life is just through hard work and determination. So I, I'm throwing all of my mental and physical energy into my recovery. And I, it is, it's incomprehensible to me that anything is permanent, uh, any of these problems, you know, and, I think they must just go away at some point. Um, I'll, I'll get my feeling back at some point. My face will move again at some point. And, and I think I'm going to be able, I withdrew from my graduate program for that semester, but I thought I'm going to rejoin in the fall and, you know, no problem. I'll, I'll be back soon. <laughs> and, uh, and that was very hard for me, you know, as the, as the months went by and it, and I hit six months and I hit seven months and I hit eight months and nine months. And, and I was like, geez, I, I, I'm permanently disabled now. And that is a hard, tough pill to swallow. That was hard for me because I was, you know, I had this incredible body that did everything I wanted it to, you know, and, and I was conventionally very pretty and I had a paralyzed face now. So, you know, my smile doesn't smile anymore and my vision was all messed up and, you know, the brain surgery was a big deal, of course, but then I had to get a couple more surgeries after that. Mm -hmm. I got a, a surgery to try and help my face regain symmetry six months after my stroke. I had eventually two surgeries on my eyes because my eyeballs were misaligned. They were pointing in the wrong directions. And that was another thing that I thought would heal. Of course it's going to heal. <laughs> it's definitely temporary. Well, no, it's not. Um, and so they had to, I waited 10 months after they did this, but um, they basically cut the muscles on the sides of my eyes and realigned my eyeball and sewed the muscles back together. They did this eye, my right eye, 10 months after my stroke, and they did my left eye 13 months after my stroke. So that was four surgeries above the neck in 13 months. And Man, that's a lot of medical trauma to go through. <laughs> yeah, that's more surgeries than you uh, ever plan for, ever imagine happening, uh, mm -hmm. ever think about, ever do anything about, you know, and then all of a sudden you're in this situation. And you know what is occurring to me um, as when I, when I reflect on who I was before all of the stuff that I went through. So I had three surgeries. I had eye surgery. I had brain surgery. And I had thyroid surgery all in the space of three years. And I was over it by then. But what occurs to me is that the previous me would have looked at somebody who appeared physically disabled and I would have never connected the trauma that had occurred physically, mentally, emotionally to that person before the physical disability. So I just assumed that they were a normal, happy guy, go lucky person, the same as they've always been. But for some reason, they have this physical inability. And that is what I think most uh, normal, in you know, inverted commas, people have never, has, you know, it's never occurred to them. It's never occurred to them that they're not only dealing with, when they come across somebody who's um, struggling for whatever reason, they're not only dealing with the uh that person not being able to get out of their wheelchair or walk or drive or do those things. They're also dealing with somebody who's emotionally been really challenged mm -hmm. and they need to be more aware of that. And people need to be more, what's the word? Uh, I'm not sure if it's compassionate or anything like that. I think they just need to be more curious about what else is happening that I'm not seeing. Actually, that's what they need to be. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, I am visibly disabled. Um, 
you can tell, you know, quote unquote, tell immediately that something has happened to me. But the biggest challenges that I face are invisible challenges. I have uh, major vision problems. Um, so I can't drive. I have double vision. It's hard for me to read. I have this constant bouncing in my eyeballs called hypertrophic olivary degeneration, which means my eyeballs are constantly moving up and down. So my entire life is like on a shaky camcorder. And you can't see that unless you're six inches from my face and looking very closely at my eyeballs. And the other thing that's invisible is my chronic pain. I have an enormous amount of nerve pain in the left side of my body where it's completely numb, but somehow also on fire and somehow also freezing. Mm -hmm. And like the worst pins and needles you've ever experienced. Mm -hmm. I, know that, I know that feeling because I have that every day on, on my left side and uh, I get really edgy when people sit on my left side and when my wife goes to touch me on the hand, unless she's being rough, it hurts and I don't want to mm. touch. I, I don't want to touch. I sleep on my left side now in bed because when I sleep on my right side, my left side uh, feels like it's colder even though I'm covered. It just feels like I'm cold and I can't get comfortable. So I sleep mm. on my left side. Because if I sleep on my left side, the mattress um, masks some of those weird sensations that my skin is creating because of the, the, the weight. So that's one way that I try and combat that. And then, um, and then in summer, I don't know whether I should put my jacket on or take it off because half of me is way too hot and the other half... <laughs> may not be yet or even if, that's even in winter like any time of the year so it's just yeah. constant forever two different sides of me two parts of me it's like they've got two bodies and i touched one and forgot the wiring of the other one and it's constantly on my mind but then sometimes i forget do you ever find yourself forgetting and and somehow just going unaware of all of the challenges that you go through? Or is it something that's constantly there? I mean, it, it feels quite constant. You know, if I, if I take some time to rest, which I do quite often during the day and I lie down and I close my eyes and I did have very little stimulation uh, and I'm not like talking to anybody or listening to anything, then you know, I can sort of forget for a little while, but really it's, it's so there. It's so present to me at every moment of my life, especially if I'm doing anything. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So tell me uh, briefly, how was your relationship affected? Well, I, you know, this sort of thing happens lots and lots and lots of, and lots of relationships end. Um, I don't know what the statistics are like in Australia, but I've been reading up in, on it in the United States, and up to 75% of marriages end in separation or divorce when one person is diagnosed with a chronic illness. And, you know, I've gotten to know a ton of stroke survivors in the past four years, and so many of them have you know, stories of heartbreak and, you know, breaking up with their significant other. So we were not an anomaly um, and it's not his fault and it's not my fault, um, but we just didn't last. We made it another 10 months after, after my stroke, but then it ended. Yeah. And I know some people, uh, you know, have your, approach it wasn't my fault wasn't his fault it just ended so that's interesting but you know some people spouses decide they are not going to hang around and help this bitch or bastard at mm. all because <laughs> they were potentially going through a tough time beforehand or something else went wrong so you know it's a good opportunity for somebody to say you know what i'm out of here i'm not 
going to hang around yeah. to sort, yeah. sort you out. But then I also understand why people would feel a need to get distance from the disability because it could potentially bring up emotions for, you know, the significant other um, that are really difficult to deal with, like their own mort mortality, their, you know, what's my life, you know, I, how am I supposed to help this person, uh, you know, feeling trapped or inadequate. You imagine that, you know, the other person on the other side is also going through a rough time and I'm not trying to make light of why, whether, and I'm not trying to take sides, whether somebody should or shouldn't leave, hang around or whatever. I was fortunate, my partner, uh, she was amazing and she hung around. Um, she was never going to leave. We, we never had difficult times before that, so it was all good. Um, but also, I'm not uh, physically disabled in that way where she needed to care for me 24 hours yeah. a day, seven days a week. So, you know, thankfully that didn't happen. So it's such a complex situation because... You know, people are also dealing with their own emotional trauma and now they're, they're dealing with the breakup. Was it right. okay for him to go at the time? Was it easy for him, for you to let him go or was it difficult? <laughs> um, no, I mean, I was completely devastated at the time. Um, but I've had a lot of time to process it by this point and now I think he made the right decision. Um, I think that something like this is going to take every single weakness you may have in your relationship and really exacerbate it mm -hmm. and, you know, touch it like a hot nerve. Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, so it doesn't surprise me that so many relationships end. And I think that, you know, if you haven't had any sort of exposure to people with disabilities beforehand, it can be, it can blow your mind, you know, in, in not a good way, in a, in a way where you feel totally overwhelmed and, and like you just want to escape. And, uh, you know, I had had some experience with a friend of mine with cerebral palsy earlier in my life. But um, my fiance really hadn't had much exposure to people with disabilities. So I think, you know, that's part of it, too. I mean, it's, yeah. it's, it's hard because it's like, <laughs> you know, that idea of I didn't sign up for this. Um, that I, I feel like that is, you know, when you're not actually married yet, <laughs> um, it's, it's a legitimate thing to yeah. to to consider so yeah fair enough hey um tell me now your art i've had a look at some of the stuff that you do and i had a look at that trailer which is on your website at the great now .com. tell me about Thank when you. you started to uh find a way to start expressing yourself with your art how did that evolve well um my relationship had ended and I had moved back to Colorado because I felt like I can't re rejoin my uh, graduate school program. And I was just at, you know, a very low point. And I uh, watched a documentary called The Crash Reel, spelled R-E-E-L. And it's about a snowboarder named Kevin Pierce, who is quite talented and he's um so exceptional that people think he's going to go to the vancouver olympics and just win everything and he gets a massive traumatic brain injury seven weeks before the olympics and the documentary follows him for the next two years of his life and he really wants to be a professional snowboarder again but he can't and he has to reconcile himself with that fact and um you know there are other aspects to the film too about extreme sports and what we ask of athletes when we keep on upping the risks in extreme sports and um also there's a section about his family his family's super supportive and he's one of five brothers and one of his brothers has 
Down syndrome. And so there's a section in the film about disability and, you know, quote unquote, acceptance. Um, I don't think acceptance is a very useful word. I think that reconciliation carries more gravity to it. I think acceptance is kind of a nothing word. Um, but I watched that film and I had a eureka moment myself and I thought, oh my God, I have to make a film right now about stroke. This film is amazing, but it's about TBI and there's a lot of similarities, but there's also some differences. And um, I think I could make an incredible film about stroke, a documentary film. So um, I, you know, kind of reached out to my network of creators because I knew some people in the industry and ended up uh, meeting up with an extremely talented woman named Lisa Donato, who is directing the film. And um, she's just been amazing. And like, as the film has sort of, been formulating I also have been creating the art pieces which are a way for me to deal with this feeling of having a shattered sense of identity and also a way to communicate to people what my mind and my body feel like now or felt like in the first two years of my stroke recovery it's um i love the i love the visual side of it so when i saw your picture your before picture and then you have a good version of that uh on the desk and then you get the copy of the before picture and you tear it up mm -hmm. and then you glue it back but now all teared up back onto the good picture it really throws your mind to another place of what you're expressing about your emotions and what you're feeling. It, you look at that and you go, okay, this is somebody who's expressing that that picture of seemingly perfection or whatever it was or normal life or everything was great, now feels torn, now feels you know disjointed, now feels all these things. When you're creating... Yeah. So you were going to say? Go Oh, well, you know, I had been an actor beforehand. And so I had this headshot, this very flattering picture of me, right, of my face. And I'm smiling, this big, beautiful smile. And a year and a half after my stroke, I'm looking at this stack of headshots that's a couple inches tall and thinking these are useless now. And I hate them. <laughs> and I... I feel so different than this person in the picture and there's no possible way for me to look like that ever again. So I just started to like, um, disassemble them and, um, uh, you know, like, um, give them flaws in certain ways. Like I would cut them and rip them and burn holes in them and, you know, slice them up and, and put them back together as a way to try and show people how I, how I felt about my, myself, you know, cause your face is yourself. It's mm. the thing that, you know, people see you, you, you can tell your bill from a picture of your face, not from a picture of your hand. Mm. <laughs> so it's like the thing that is emblematic of you. And especially for an actor, your face is terribly important. And for a woman, your face is very important. Mm. So I just, I felt uh, the need to disassemble them and reassemble them in, in different ways. Yeah. Uh, they're very powerful. The one that was the most powerful was when you were cutting it with the, uh, with the blade and uh, just sort of tearing little holes and, and slits in it until it was gone and then by burning it I don't know it just spoke to me there was just something about mm -hmm. it and I could I could sense your uh, your emotional state at the time mm -hmm. um, as the uh, trailer changes I'm not sure if it's before that that 
um, picture scene or after that picture scene, we see the Barbie doll. Mm -hmm. Tell me a little bit about your thinking about Barbie doll. What went into that? Well, so, you know, I used to be so in tune with my body and I would dance and do yoga and stuff. So I was so familiar with it and, and, and I loved it. And after a stroke, it just feels completely different and so bizarre the things that are going on in your in your um in your body like you ask your hand to do something and maybe it doesn't do it at all or maybe your foot starts doing something instead <laughs> and it's just so strange and i would go to these doctors appointments over and over and over again for you know a year and a half and explain to them what my body felt like and I just felt like no one was really understanding me. And so then I thought, as opposed to drawing something, if you take something that is a human form already, like a Barbie doll, and then make it look like you feel, mm -hmm. then that will communicate to people more effectively. So I've done several different ones, and they're all about the nerve pain that I feel. Um, and one of them is encased in gray clay, so it looks like concrete. And that one's about the numbness and the lack of proprioception and the heaviness. And then I've done one with rubber bands that is trying to show the tightness that I feel, and one with vice grips, and there's a couple of others, one with nails. Um, yeah, so I'm making a whole series, and I want to have an art show with this stuff. Yeah, that... Every one of those things that you did, the uh, elastic band that covers all of them, that is so uh, you've nailed it with regards to not only how you feel, but also how it feels for me. It does. It feels like my muscles are all tight, and then it feels um, and then it feels um, heavy and bound or or restricted. So I can see the the concrete, you know, thinking behind it. Everything you've done um, is really well uh, expressing how it is. And what I'd love to do now every time I see them and think about our discussion you know, right now, what I'm thinking is, wouldn't it be great to get some, um, some people who turn up to a location, be it an exhibition or something, and encase them in something that's not the amount of rubber bands that they would need, <laughs> but a few, or put on a heavy suit on one side of their body for them and tell them to walk, or or do something that's a physical, disable them uh, temporarily in, in, in a physical way so that they can sort of try and get a bit of an idea of what it is that people go through. It'll, it'll take it to the next level. So um, I did that once, actually. <laughs> I made, because, you know, I'm always trying to find out ways to communicate to people what this experience is like. So I made a fake arm and I like made it about the weight of human arm and or about the weight of my arm. And I like sewed it into a shirt so that you could actually <laughs> have this arm kind of dangling next to you and it would like bounce against the side of you when you walked and if you were sitting down you know and you could put it on your lap and you would feel the weight of it on your lap all the time and um uh, i think that that was a good thing to do yeah it would give people an insight and i know there's a lot of people that are curious that want to know what it's like because they want to be more supportive or or they want to be more interested in topics of ability and inability or disability so i think the more we do that the better and what's great about what you're doing is you're going to turn it into a movie how did you possibly come up with the idea to create a movie about this and where are we at with it now how long ago was that well the initial inspiration was watching the crash reel and then i've watched a ton of documentaries since then with the idea of you know how do i how do I construct something that is the film that I want it to be? And 
we've been working on it now for a couple of years, Lisa and I, and the more we work on it, the more we refine it. And I think it's going to be so good when it comes out. Um, in terms of the, our status, basically we've pulled a little bit of money together here and there to do a couple of days of shooting because we want it to look nice and professional and got to pay the cinematographer and the sound guy and the gaffer and that kind of stuff. So, you know, we've just done it kind of nibble by nibble here and there and um, gotten some really solid material. And last fall, we did a crowdfunding campaign. We raised 43,000 American dollars um, for the film, which is so great because it, it shows the world you know, it's not just me and Lisa that want to see this film. It's a lot of other people, too. Yeah. So that was great to have so many supporters from all over the world pitching in, you know, five or ten dollars or whatever. Um, and people are welcome to donate at any time if they would like, because we're always, you know, trying to gather a little bit more and a little bit more money to make the film as high quality as we want it to be. You can donate on the website. Uh, there's a link to go to. Uh, you can use a credit card. Um, and then in terms of finishing it, I really hope it's going to be done by the end of 2019. Um, but it's a, it's a very long process, as I am learning. I was not a filmmaker before this, but it is a years-long process to make a feature-length film. And... <laughs> I didn't quite realize that getting into it, but it is, and it is so worth it. And, um, you know, the, the material that we have out there right now, the teaser video that you can see on the website. Um, if you also go to the bottom of the website, you can click on a link and see our crowdfunding video from last fall. I think those are both such solid pieces, you know, uh -huh. and they're just two minutes and three minutes. Um, but we want to make a film that's 90 minutes and yes. is that good. So it, it takes a while, but I am, I'm really enthused about it. And I, I want to reach people. I want to reach people with disabilities, people who can't leave their houses easily. So we're going to have it on a streaming platform of some sort when it's finished. Beautiful. I'm looking forward to it. Uh, the teaser was what made me send the email to you to see if I can get you on for an interview um, because I was so impressed by it and I wanted to find out more. And then I was so impressed by your art, I wanted to find out more. And my the thing that I did to raise awareness was, um, I, was I don't consider myself arty, although I, I enjoy what I'm doing, artful types of things. Um, the thing that I could could contribute was this podcast and creating awareness in, in this way because it's the easiest for me. I get in front of a computer, press record, and then I upload that to the internet and I'm basically done. Um, and it's not hours or it's sorry, it's not years and years of production work and all that kind of stuff to get it done. It's uh, only hours. It fills me with a tremendous amount of joy. It gives me purpose. Um, it, it, I get more out of it than I thought I would. I'm wondering about now that you're at this stage, you know, four years post-stroke, uh, overcoming your challenges, certainly still dealing with a lot of them. What does it mean to you to have this project uh, to work on and how does that help you moving forward? Well, it's, it's great to have some purpose and some reason to want to get up in the morning because there are definitely some mornings early on where I did not want to get up. And, um, you know, I couldn't work for a long time. And then I started to work some doing some administrative stuff from home, very part time for a friend of mine. Um, and I'm so grateful that I that I can work a little bit, but it, it, it wasn't like creatively fulfilling. And I, I was an actor and a creator for a long time. And I would also 
produce and direct a lot of live theater and live improv comedy. And suddenly I'm feeling like that sort of creative element of my life is gone because I can't move around the way I used to. And, um, you know, live theater necessitates getting somewhere in person. (laughs) Um, So this film comes into my life and it, and it is the place where I'm putting all of my creative energy right now. And it's very satisfying. And I just, I want to reach people. I want to reach people who were in the same place that I was, you know, a year after my stroke in this place of, of real desolation and, uh, and talk about now what, you know, that's the title of the film because I had all these plans and I thought I had my life figured out in terms of I'm going to do A, B, C, D and, and then everything radically changes. And that is sad. It is a tragedy. And I don't want to, you know, negate the tragedy or underplay the tragedy because it is really, really, really hard. But then the question is, what happens after the tragedy? And I want to, I want to answer that question with this film. Yeah. That's a great thing to answer. It's a great thing to give back to uh, the world at large and the community of people who are recovering from some kind of a traumatic life uh, health challenge and now are disabled. Um, it was, I, 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 from time to time, and I'm not sure if you've already started to get people contacting you and saying, that's amazing, thank you for doing that, but I, I get that type of, feedback from people thanks for that episode that's the episode i just needed um and i was going to stop doing this at one point because i didn't think it was going to get traction i started to question my ability to interview you know all the crazy stuff that people do about feeling um unable or incapable or afraid to put your voice out there to be judged to be all these things you know that was all going through my mind and it and it took me uh you know, it took me about a year to find the courage to release my first episode. And then I did that for some time and then I stopped doing them and I didn't put out an episode for maybe nine or 10 months. And, you know, the, the listeners fell away as they do and all those things changed. And it was me dealing with my issues and my concerns again. I was going through an emotionally hard time uh, physically tough time. I was working in a place I didn't want to work. And it's the one thing that got me going and feeling that I have purpose again and feeling better about myself again and exploring this art of mine, which is talking to people and getting their stories out of them. And and what motivates me the most and what makes it impossible for me to stop now is the feedback from the people who need it the most, who I didn't know were out there. Mm-hmm. Um, how has it, how has the trailer been received so far? And what's some of the feedback from the people that have supported you through the GoFundMe campaign? Well, the, the teaser video has been very popular and uh, you can find it on the website and on Vimeo where we have over 4,000 views and you know, it's just two minutes, but it's very effective. And um, it also teaches you some things that you maybe you didn't know. Like in the United States, a person has a stroke every 40 seconds and only 10% of stroke survivors make full recovery. And um, in that way, you know, people who had absolutely no experience with stroke felt like they learned something, which is great. But also just in general, um, people, it has an emotional impact. And many people have told me that they were very powerfully affected by it. And then, you know, stroke survivors like yourself and others have, have talked to me about this idea of identity and seeing yourself, you know, and your 
picture of your face being ripped up and reassembled or your body being uh, persecuted in this way and 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 this idea of uh, living with chronic pain and and chronic pain being invisible and that being such a, a struggle for some people because other people don't understand it. Um, a lot of people have gotten back to me with positive feedback about that stuff in the in the teaser. So it's it has a lot to offer people in a lot of different ways. Did you? So ever... if you like it, you should share it online. Yeah. And uh, uh, May is going to be Stroke Awareness Month in the United States, so we're going to make an extra effort to you know get it out there even more in the month of May. Yeah, awesome. Well, I'll support that and I'll uh, definitely do my bit. Um, did you ever get to the point during this last couple of years of developing the movie, filming, all this type of thing where you said, it's not worth it, I'm not doing this anymore, I've had enough? <laughs> well, I mean, let's talk about frustration for a sec. <laughs> if, uh, if you could die of frustration, I would be dead years ago, right? <laughs> Being a stroke survivor is so immensely frustrating. Um, and, you know, there are plenty of times where I've just wanted to give up on life in general. Um, so, so yes, it's, it's tough to put one foot in front of the other metaphorically or literally, uh, every day. Um, and sometimes I congratulate myself just on getting through today. Um, to, tomorrow will be a, a, its own challenge, but, um, yeah, I mean, I, <laughs> I thought I had experienced challenges earlier in my life, but, uh, this one is certainly uh, makes all of them sound tiny <laughs> in yeah. comparison. Yeah. But, you know, the old you, you know, the one that you tore up and uh, said is no longer you, she's gone in, in one of your pieces. Do you still, though, draw on her way of overcoming things and use some of what she has taught you in the past and help you overcome in the past, even though there were a lot smaller challenges, you still draw on her to help you overcome some of the things that you're going through now? Well, yeah. I mean, in some ways I feel like a brand new person, but I am the person I have been for the past 37 years of my life. And I think that I had a certain amount of determination and force of will in my previous life that I tried to use on my stroke recovery to make my stroke vanish. You know, I thought this thing that's happened to me um, is going to be a secret and I'm going to be able to hide it away and pretend like it never happened. Um, and then I realized that brain uh, brain damage cannot be fixed through force of will. But um, now I feel like I'm trying to use that determination and force of will to get the film complete because it is so important to me. I've never felt uh, this much desire to complete one specific thing as I have felt to get this film done. Yeah, I can relate to that. Hey, tell me about the mood of the film. So my sense about this podcast is that it's really difficult to make it light and airy and make it less doom and gloomy now not of course i'm always interviewing survivors which is great can't interview people that are not here uh, i'm also always interviewing people that have overcome uh, different levels of disability uh, and still dealing with different levels of emotional trauma challenge you know, mental uh, issues, a lot of the invisible stuff. How do you, um, how do you feel the mood of the documentary is? Like, what's that like? Well, you know, initially, I wanted to make a project about quote unquote overcoming, right? But um, as the film has evolved and as I have evolved, I don't think that's very useful. Um, and I also think that the way that disabled people are often portrayed 
in film is that they're either overcoming and happy-go-lucky and they aren't disabled anymore because they're cured or they uh, kill themselves uh, or they die of their disability. And I'm like, that is a crappy way to have me and my community portrayed. And there happens to be a, a theater company here in Denver that only casts actors with disabilities and you have to have a disability under the American Dis with disabilities act in order to audition. So that's a phys physical, cognitive, emotional, or intellectual disability. And they've been in Denver for 30 years. And I feel so blessed and lucky to be a part of this company because the idea is not to overcome your disability. The idea is not to hide your disability. The company elevates people with disabilities and celebrates them and, you know, does an amazing production every summer that shows the world that they are just as talented and capable as anyone else. And I think that you know, I, I resist, I'm trying to resist the overcoming something idea. Um, because, you know, you got to live with it. You got to live with your disabilities and, 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 and reckon with them and, and, and figure out how to deal with your life after they arrive. <laughs> I'm glad I asked you that question. Really, I am. Because you've answered a question that was something that was puzzling me for a little bit. And, I think each episode of mine will be different as each individual is different and as each challenge that they face is different. So I think it's great that I, I don't have to worry about making it airy and fluffy and feel good all the time. Right. So make it what right. it is. Life, life is not, you know, all airy and fluffy and good, but it's not all terrible and bad. It just yeah. is what it is. Yeah. Good. I have to think about that less now. And it'll take up less of my brain power to work it out. We'll just go with the flow is basically what we'll do. And I suppose that's a, a lot of what happens in stroke recovery and in disability in dealing with disability is you go with the flow. And for me, the flow, yeah. the flow is different every day. Sometimes the river runs fast. Sometimes it's still. Sometimes it runs cold. Sometimes it runs warmer. You know, sometimes you can see through the water right to the bottom. Sometimes you can't see through it because it's murky for some reason. And you just got to go with it the way that it is on that particular day. And um, like you said, look, uh, you know, if you're going through a tough one, just think about tomorrow could be a better one. It could be easier to deal with. Now, there's a lot of people talk about, um, and I do too, we talk about, um, we talk about, um, what's the word? We talk about, um, mind. Hang on a sec. What's the word? We talk about mindset. Golly gosh, that was hard to get set out. Uh, we talk about mindset. What's your take on mindset? Because everyone kind of uh, in the in the self help world, in the uh, uh, you're going to be amazing, making millions of dollars world. It's all about mindset, mindset, mindset. Mm -hmm. And part of what I like to do is support people so that they understand that mindset is important and that if your mindset is a negative one or you focus your mindset in a way which is negative, perhaps your challenges are harder or more difficult to deal with. Um, tell me about what you think about mindset. Well, I, I think your mindset is incredibly important and um you know, you, this is such a mental challenge. Uh, there are certainly plenty of physical challenges, but I have felt most um, most challenged by the psychological element of this illness. And, you know, I, I used to be such a happy-go-lucky person and uh, very positive and upbeat. And I think that, and perky, you know? <laughs> um, and I think part of that was because in general, I think women are sort of trained to be that um, kind of 
person in life. You, know, you want to be agreeable and pers- pleasing and, and not cause problems, not be angry. Um, so I couldn't be that anymore. I had no capacity to be that person anymore and no energy to be that person anymore. Uh, Because it takes a lot of energy, I found out, to be like that. (laughs) So now I'm in a different mindset entirely, but it's all about, like, what is what is next? And I certainly had a, a long period of feeling exceptionally um, pathetic <laughs> and uh, very sorry for myself and I and I wouldn't go outside and I didn't want to do anything social and I didn't want to see anybody, especially anybody who hadn't seen me yet. You know, it was very hard to see people for the first time after my stroke. Mm. And there were people that I resisted seeing for years after my stroke. Um, But actually, just a couple months ago, I went to my 15-year college reunion. And so I saw a ton of people who knew me in college when I was perfectly healthy. And I thought that was a major step forward to be able to do that and see those people. And that is a question of mindset that I'm just going to go forward. You know, how you talk to yourself in your own mind is such a big part of this. And I have actually a sign on my refrigerator over there that says, be kind to yourself. Because, boy, have I been unkind to myself and mean and frustrated and... um, so like disparaging to myself and you know that's cruel you shouldn't be unkind to yourself because the world is plenty unkind on its own (laughs) and and uh you know the way you talk about yourself you can say oh i'm you know just i'm permanently disabled and i'm you know, my partner left me and I have no job and I blah 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 or or you can talk about yourself in a more positive light. Like, you know, I'm an actor with a disability. I'm a person with a disability. I, you know, I perform with a theater company for people with disabilities. And I, I work on a film that is going to help expose stroke and disability and chronic pain to the wider world in a way that will build compassion and understanding. So that is a Jedi mind trick. You got to play on yourself to talk to yourself in a, in a compassionate way, because it's very easy to talk to yourself like you hate yourself. And I certainly have hated myself for long periods of this, but I'm trying not to anymore. Yeah, there's no point. It doesn't achieve anything. Uh, I do love your insight, though. Uh, the Jedi mind trick is a, is a really good one um, because that's what it is. It is just literally using the same energy or even less energy to have better thoughts and better uh, descriptions of yourself. And this was a topic of yesterday's uh, podcast episode, which hasn't been released yet, which was similar um, with Jenny McAllister who talks about, um, you know, that she was hard on herself and I've been hard on myself. I think what motivates me now the most, uh, and I'm not sure about you and other people, but what motivates me the most now is missing out. So now I don't want to miss out. So I think about my mortality because I've already experienced that possibility. And I think about if, if I went out in a little while, whenever it is, and I had the opportunity to, just think about my regrets, what my regrets were. I don't have that many. But the podcast, if I don't do that and I don't take it to the level where I want to, I'm going to have – that is going to be a regret and that is going to be something that I'm going to feel like I missed out on. And I don't want to go out that way. I don't want to go out thinking I missed out on something that I was afraid to do or try or learn about. If I miss out on – with regards to other things, my health didn't allow me at the time or my condition or whatever, that's okay, I'm, up, I'm, I'm okay with that. But missing out because I didn't um, try is not 
not going to happen. Mm-hmm. Uh, do you feel like you're missing out on anything? You know, honestly, I don't. I was um, very adventurous in my life, and I traveled a lot before I got sick, and I did a lot of bold experimental uh, projects, and um, I I feel like I really did so much in my life already before I turned 33 and had this stroke. Uh, I, that I lived an entire lifetime already. And then when I was sick, I spent nine full days unable to move, unable to speak, communicating through my hand, um, unable to breathe on my own. And I was suspended in this place between life and death. And death was so, so near for so long that I really came to terms with it. I feel like Mm -hmm. I am not afraid of my own death anymore. And I could die in 10 minutes. I could die in 10 years. I could die in 50 years. It doesn't really matter to me. Um, I just, I want to reach as many people as I can in the meantime. Beautiful. On that note, We'll wrap up. Uh, This has been an amazing opportunity to uh, learn from somebody else. Thank you so much for that. Uh, Thank you, Bill. Yeah, my pleasure. Um, I'm going to look forward to uh, the release of the documentary. I'm going to look forward to following your work. I'm going to look forward to uh, your art exhibition. Um, I'm so far away from you, but somehow I'm going to keep on top of things and, um, and focus uh, on seeing that that piece of work. Uh, my, and maybe the film, maybe the film will be at the Melbourne Film Festival. We oh can my! Meet in person. Oh my! <laughs> wouldn't that be amazing? Um, I plan on um, coming to the states at some point. Um, so wouldn't it be good if I could come to the states and see the film while it was being um, launched or first shown or something like that? My wife would jump at the chance of saying we're going to the United States. She'll be straight on the plane with me. So uh, let's see if we can make that happen somehow. Um, As we wrap up, you know what I've become aware of? And remember at the beginning of the video of our interview, before I started recording, I said to you, can you sit in the middle because we're um, we're, we're potentially going to not be able to see some of you. As the interview has progressed, you've moved closer and closer to the edge of the frame and I was gonna oh. it doesn't matter <laughs> it doesn't matter it really doesn't matter I was going to remind you to come to the middle of the frame but then I figured mm. nah just let it go because naturally what's happened is your body has moved to that position and you haven't noticed it and I think it's important to emphasize that and to show that as well in that we have these um, involuntary things that occur and uh, our body does things that it we don't really know or want it to do and we can't do anything about it. Um, so it's been a really slow and gradual movement to the other side and, <laughs> and it's kind of been perfect because it helps to illustrate all those things that you're trying to illustrate. Um, so I'm okay with it. Can you tell the people watching and listening where they can find out more about your documentary or your movie yourself and your art yes so we have a website for the film it's the title of the film the great now what.com and you can go on the website and watch the teaser there and if you like it please share it online and you can learn a little bit more about the film who the people are who are working on it um and uh go and donate if you would like to donate Also, we have a Facebook page for the film, and I try and put something on it every day that is a positive quote or something about stroke, something about disability, something about cavernous angioma, which is what caused my stroke, um, or something newsworthy about the film. Uh, So join the Facebook page if you would like. And also 
on the website, you can join our email list. And I send out an email every couple of weeks uh, with some really beautiful production stills and info on what is happening next. Awesome. And I hope that you send out this uh, link to the podcast that we've just recorded uh, in one of your emails. That'd be great. Oh, for sure. For sure. Oh, and I, th- I don't know if I mentioned on Facebook, just search for the great now what and there's the page. Yeah, I'll have all the links there. And uh, would you accept uh, a very small donation as much as uh, a cup of coffee, the cost of a cup of coffee? Do they have to be massive donations? Exactly. Yeah, anything, anything would be much appreciated. Yeah, awesome. Well, thank you so much for joining me on the podcast. I look forward to keeping in touch with you and um, learning more about what it is that you're doing and seeing how everything evolves. Thank you so much for the opportunity and thank you to everyone listening. Discover how to support your recovery after stroke. Go to recoveryafterstroke.com.